Rider. We spoke up there about AI. We spoke up there about blockchain. So what is Alex going to tell us? Alex Yakolin, the co-founder and chief innovation officer of Catalyst. Welcome him to the stage, please. Hello. Let me see if this starts showing. So I'll be talking about the future of marketing. But you might be wondering, um, who am I? Who's this guy? I am actually a scientist. I've spent um, many years developing image formats like uh, Ping and JPEG. Um, billions of people are using it apparently every day. Also some robots on Mars. Um, then I did research in AI, won the award from the European Association of, um, for AI. Um, for my research, I was a professor of data science at Columbia. And then I left uh, to start a company. So, and it's, it's a company that works on the future of marketing. So you might be thinking, Alex wants to get rich and automate marketing. Well, here is the thing. Marketing is too important to be automated. So, you know, the whole internet is really powered by advertising. Google is powered by advertising. Meta is powered by advertising. It's all based on advertising. Yet, you know, who of you likes ads? I don't like them. That's like bad advertising. I think we can do better. And this presentation is going to be about you know, what could that future be? Now, to understand marketing, we have to go a little back. Markets are one of the foundations of civilization. Markets have been the places where the earliest technologies have been incubated. For example, you know, before there was writing, there were these tokens that were basically like representing different goods and quantities. So this was like 10,000 year old chopping carts. And then on the right, you see some of the earliest examples of writing about you know, 6,000 years old, and there were receipts. Receipts for different goods that people bought. This one's funny, that's a um, negative review, bad quality copper. 5,000 years old, all right? It's, it's funny, right? Like, it's, it's about commerce. Commerce is what you do in markets. And let's take a look, all right? So Amazon, market leader, that's what you get when you get onto Amazon. It's basically a kind of a shelf, displays lots of different products, um, all right? 25 years ago, the screens were smaller, but you know, I think the UX was better. Um, still kind of a, like a shelf. So where, you know, where does this shelf come from? And you're going to laugh at the name. It comes from Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly invented the modern shop, you know, the modern store with self-service shelves where you pick up products and you, you put them in the cart. Piggly Wiggly actually patented shopping carts and checkouts. So here is, you're going to say, okay, okay, but like on Amazon, you can do a search. And if I'm searching for a lamp, that's what I get. But when you actually mark all the advertising and navigation, you basically just see three lamps. So let's take a look at the catalog from Sears from 150 years ago. Um, I think it looks better than Amazon today. All right, so here is a word that some of you might know, and it's skeuomorphism. Skeuomorphism is when you have a new technology that people don't yet understand or don't want to understand, um, and everything just imitates the old, right? Like the early cars had horsepowers and looked like carriages. 
because people weren't really ready for the modern car. It took like 40 years for modern cars to emerge. And even now, like, you know, Tesla's got like a thousand horsepowers and the Rimac has 2000 horsepowers. Like the whole notion of horsepower doesn't make sense anymore. You know, we've, we're beginning to move on. So the current e-commerce, I think is still like emailing PDFs. Like we're still living in the past, but you know, there is a future. If, if you look at commerce in real world, it's taking advantage of the best technologies, the best materials, the best architecture. You know, some of the best designed architecture actually is done specifically for marketplaces. And, you know, we also have state-of-the-art digital technologies, digital products. Thing is, it's not really used for commerce. It's not used for markets. It's used for advertising. And, you know, you have this like state-of-the-art media with ads and then you tap on them and then you get sent to like something else that's basically the Piggly Wiggly world. That's the disconnect. And we've begun recognizing that, you know, this um, might be a problem. Um, here is an example of, of a town, you know, do you see any banner ads here? You don't like the, the, the more pleasant the town, the more pleasant the experience, the fewer ads there are going to be. You're just going to sit down and you're going to buy coffee. You're going to buy food. You won't have to like get up and get across the street to the, to the shop and then come back and carry it like that. That would be, you know, inferior banner ad advertising is really in the physical world. It's used to monetize the desert wastelands along highways. Okay. Yet, like, you know, most of our digital media is still monetized by advertising. It's kind of ironic. So I think the future of markets is going to be seamlessly integrated commerce into, you know, whatever media digital reality uh, we're going to be using. And to understand it, let's, let's go back and like really think about marketing. You know, marketing is not good or bad. Marketing is matchmaking. It's, it's matching people, buyers, you know, with products and services. Yes, there are good customers, there are bad customers, there are good products, there are bad products, but you know, what is the goal is to have a good fit. Bad marketing is a bad fit. Good marketing is a good fit. So currently, the way these things work with advertising is that the sellers put money up to be shown to the customers who are in, enjoying media. But it's a little perverse. Like you've, you've got the highest bidder, like whoever pays the most for the ad is basically the ad that's going to get shown. Then the customers do a search and again, the sellers bid basically who's going to pay the most to have that shown. So here you see the problem of AI and automation and all of that, like our algorithmic reality, like it doesn't matter what is good for the customer. It's like whoever pays the most. Now the hopes and dreams of media to make more money has been targeted advertising, which is, you know, honestly kind of really sick. So think of an example, like if they know if I'm fat or skinny, that's going to affect the ads I'm going to see. So if I'm fat, I'm going to get an ad for ice cream. So I get more of it. And if I'm skinny, I'm going to get an ad for a salad subscription. Like in both cases, it's exactly like the wrong thing. So remember again, like this is a high quality environment, you know, no ads, no walking around, actually the the people that you interact with have your interests in mind. They help you, they advise you. So commerce media is this vision where the media and the commerce are going to be seamlessly integrated in the same way. And McKinsey is predicting that this is going to be over a trillion dollars in value. I think it's going to be tens of trillions of dollars. But what is actually meant by commerce media. Just because it's seamless does not necessarily mean it's good. So I made this chart, there are four quadrants. If you go up, it means it's good 
for media. Now, if you go to the right, it's good for sellers. Now, let's zoom in. Retail media is where most of the commerce media money is turning around these days. And basically, it's commerce companies trying to figure out media. And that's what it looks like. So market leader, Amazon, offers that page on the left as an example of content about Stephen King. Eh. And then I've already shown you the um, search results. Like Amazon is actually not selling products. They're selling ads about products to the highest bidder. OK, zooming out again. Here is media stores. This is like the other way around. This is media companies trying to figure out how to do commerce. So you can see what TikTok's trying to do. Like basically, they've implemented Amazon inside TikTok. Well, not particularly inspiring. I think there's some interesting applications, which is live shopping. Um, so you're basically watching live stream, and they're showing you products, and you buy them. Um, I think it's interesting, but it's still going to be a relatively small relative percentage of the, of the whole market. You can see embedded commerce on the top right. You know, obviously, that's the best one. Uh, so let me show you what could that look like. So embedded commerce media means that the commerce technology is kind of seamlessly integrated into the media. Right? So for example, when you, when you sit at a restaurant, the waiter is going to come with a little scanner you know, for the credit card. Like that's basically the commerce technology that you see in a high quality environment. And I think it's going to be kind of like that also in the digital realm. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So here is an example of a, of a web page where you know, commerce just pops up. Like the same way that a designer can put YouTube onto a page without having to know everything about video, here, with this new technology, a web designer is going to be able to just copy and paste and put commerce for any product that might be sold by whoever else on the page. And everything's going to work seamlessly. So that's like for an ordinary web page. But you know, can we do new types of experiences? Okay, so instead of a shelf in e-commerce, you know, here we have some sort of a 3D interactive experience where you, know, you can look at watches, zoom in, zoom out, tap, and then if you want to buy, of course you can buy. And here is the e-commerce technology kind of popping in and getting the job done. Now, remember when I told you I don't want to automate marketing? Here is an interesting example. This is um, a web page of a writer that's written a couple of books. And he doesn't show you his books on the shelf. He actually starts a conversation. He asks you, which writer are you? You know, tells you, these are books about writers. Which writer are you? All right? So if I decide, you know, I'm probably talented, this is the book that would be recommended, and I could then just buy it right there and then from the publisher, but on the writer's page. Lots of interesting ideas that can come out of it. But what is, what is the bread and butter? Like, how do we do this today? And the answer is, there is this thing called affiliate marketing, and many of you are probably familiar with it. But the point is that when you're reading an article and that article sends you to a particular product, the merchant will usually <laughs> promise to compensate whoever actually sends them the customer, right? So this is called affiliate marketing. But with embedded commerce, we can make it better. We can actually put the commerce experience inside the article. And this is actually good for everyone. You know, it's good for the publisher because, you know, they're now a space. Like, someone doesn't have to leave the media experiences. They can complete the purchase within that media experience. It's also good for the seller because they, they sell at a higher rate. Less friction, you know, people who have to go across the street to, to a store, like sometimes get distracted and, and don't actually buy. And it's good for us. We have a more streamlined experience, but even more importantly, instead of buying inside those silly catalogs, we're now buying from people who, who care about these products, who, um, hmm, that's, uh, I think someone else's this computer. Ah, okay. Um, so I've shown you these examples. Um, embedded commerce is real. 
how should we use it? What is, you know, what is going to be the future? Uh, because that is kind of like what can currently be done. I, I think the future is going to be really exciting. And again, there is this role of a market where buyers and sellers find each other. And they find each other voluntarily. They don't have to be advertised. And one of the really good examples are central town markets. Like every, in the center of every town, there is a big square where they would hold markets. There is one in Split. Uh, and during COVID, I was locked down in Pula. So in Pula, there is this 120-year-old architectural marvel of, of, um, of a central market. And it's still the number one shopping destination in Pula. So no new shopping mall is competitive with this 120-year-old market. And during COVID, I was, I was going there almost every day. Um, I got to know the merchants. I bought various things. They taught me about things I didn't know. It was, it was very human. It was very intuitive. And I wish we could have more of it. And I think this technology is going to make it possible. Now, there can be many markets. Every seller can be a part of many markets. Every buyer can go to many markets. You know, we don't have to have one market for everything like, you know, Amazon. Uh, if we have many markets, then we get competition. We get dynamism. We get innovation. So we want to have very low barriers to entry for creating new markets. And that's kind of like what we're doing. And we're, we're, we're creating market space where it's going to be just as easy to create a market as it is to create a web page or um, to create an app. So there is going to be lots of different um, new um, ideas and um, it, it, it's going to grow basically kind of a network of, of products, network of curators. Because the hero in this future is going to be a curator. A curator is someone who's really enthusiastic about a particular type of product, a particular type of service. They are the ones that I really want to be buying from. I want to be buying from someone who is enthusiastic about uh, a particular product, who knows them. No automation can do that. What, what does a computer know about like, which umbrella is very good? Like, AI can only operate with the data that's available. And when you have a new product, when you have an innovation, there is no data. So humans know how other humans are going to experience those products. If I do a review, what do I know? I've only tried maybe two of those products. But an enthusiast has tried all of them. So that's what we want to support. And I think this is going to be a multi-trillion dollar opportunity to basically leverage this type of technologies to create new market spaces. But there is one more thing that I'm excited about. And that's that this creates also a future for journalism. Marshall McLuhan uh, was a philosopher of media that had so many incredibly perceptive observations about what's happening. Like, if, if you want to understand the internet, you actually have to read Marshall McLuhan. And in 64, he said, the foundation for press is the classified ads. So classified ads were basically this little ads that people sent to the newspaper and the newspaper organized them and published them. Right? This was the foundation. This was a kind of an economic basis for those um, newspapers. The news were kind of an extra. And when Craigslist and other companies came in and started doing the classified ads, journalism kind of went down, and with journalism going down, also the quality of political discourse went down. You know, now everyone's just arguing, and, uh, you know, there is not that much civility and culture in politics, and this is kind of making everything worse. So I think that embedded commerce and commerce media are also a new future for journalism. But with that, I... I've kind of dedicated my life to this. It's really important to me. I would love to talk to you. I would love to hear criticisms, thoughts, ideas. I, I would love to collaborate. I think 
it was split as a kind of a unique place. Like the, the, this was the this was the space of the Venetian Republic. This was the the merchant superpower of the world. So I think we have this in our culture. You know, we can pull it out. Like this is probably the place where we can do this. Um, you know, better than anyone else. So I think what would be cool is to have one one place in the world where this technology is really understood, where this technology is really developed. And it's not huge, like you don't need a whole Silicon Valley to do this. You can do this with fewer people and you can do it really, really well. And maybe, maybe things can coalesce and um, we can start creating this. I would also like to thank a bunch of people who helped me make this presentation. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Okay, you're not going anywhere yet, because we have some time for some questions. So, who here works in marketing? Give me a wave, or make, oh, there we go, there's one. Who else works in, come on, there's got to be more people in marketing. Put your hands up. Good, okay. All of those people have questions, right? We're going to get a microphone over here. Uh, who has a question about the future of marketing, or who has a different opinion about the future of marketing? We've got a few minutes now, so give the, the guy with the microphone, Microphone a wave. I'll wait for it. It's coming. Hands up if you've got a question, please. Silence. There we go at the front. Second row over here. <coughs> Alex, uh, beautiful uh, presentation. I have a question about uh, the, the key start of the whole story was the current uh, manipulatory state of the big guys where you have to sell uh, or buy your piece of uh, marketing space uh, from two or three names on the market. Uh, how do you see the future of not just the market but the marketing how how to easily connect the buyers to the sellers that are searching for the stuff they need you know like without just uh, today's model of investing money and a lot of money to get a really small amount of clients that's an awesome question. So, so right now, there was, um, there was a report that uh, Meta put out not long ago, and they estimated that um, it costs around 30 euro to get one customer through social media advertising. Okay, so if it costs 30 euro to get one customer, who can afford this advertising? Well, overpriced shit. <laughs> you know, you, you, uh, most products are just not, able to afford social media advertising. Like social media advertising become a congested footwalk. Um, we, we need to open this up. We need to broaden it up. And um, the, you know, the answer is basically we need, we need markets that are going to be on the open web. Uh, and however, how are we going to find them? So here is the cool thing. Like technology allows you to make markets of markets. And once you have markets of markets, then you have a business model for search engines. So there is this whole opportunity for creating a new um, kind of an internet, uh, which doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. Like we already have the, the standards for transmitting information and publishing it and so on. We just need to have a business model that supports the creation of new websites, the, the creation of, of new um, apps. And if you remember, like before, the advertising became so expensive. There was so much more innovation. Like, remember earlier in the early 2000s, you know, there were many more innovations? Well, it was possible to have innovations because marketing wasn't so expensive. You know, now you have to borrow money to buy those ads, and, you know, the end result is, is expensive and not very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? 
If not, then what we'll do is um, obviously you're going to be here for the rest of the evening, dancing up there later, right? Yeah. So look for the black shirt, the beige trousers, the guy holding the laptop. Yeah. I hope hopefully you put that down and have a beer in your hand. Yeah. Another round of applause, please, for Alex. Find him later if you have any questions.